Hi guys! Happy New Year! Welcome back for episode 20 of the weekly playback. I did not do a video last week because it was Christmas weekend and my brother-in-law had generously gifted the family a trip to Las Vegas, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the video in case anyone wants to hear about my trip because I did meet the Gaming Goat Gang, so that was really fun. Um, so yeah, so let's get into the games that I play. There are not a lot of games and with COVID numbers back on the rise, I think, um, you know, it'll be harder and harder to game in person again. Um, so I'm probably going to have to go back to having a small group of people who I will be gaming with on a regular basis, which will probably mean more two and three player uh, plays of games rather than the higher player accounts. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, but yeah, so let's just get into the games for this week so there's not too many to discuss. The first one I will talk about is Widget Ridge, which I got a review copy of at PAX Unplugged. So this is a 2019 game designed by Ian Taylor, art by Matt Burton. Um, it's actually published by Fury's Tree Games. Last time I, in my PAX Unplugged video, I thought that the publisher was Widget Ridge. I don't know why I thought that, but it's actually Fury's Tree Tree games, um, which I don't even know if it's if it's on the oh it is on the box okay <laughs> so um, it's for one to two players it's a deck building game and they did say that you can combine decks and uh, increase the player count so in this game you are creating machines so you're gonna start your hand with some basic cards and you're gonna have these things which are called spark and you're also going to have like uh, money that you are trying to was it money or water? Uh, which one's the spark? I think the blue stuff is the spark. Let me just remember. Sorry, I don't want to... Uh, yeah, blue stuff is the spark. Gold is the money. That makes more sense. Okay, but I would expect spark to be something other than blue. But anyway, so you're going to have some basic cards in your hand and some of them are just going to show like money, some of them are going to show spark, some of them will show both, and you're going to have a marketplace where you can of course purchase new cards. You're going to start with some basic machine parts in your hand. So there's basically you're trying to create a machine and trying to do other stuff like create cool like machines that will give you better abilities. The first player to reach 100 spark will win. So you will have devices and device cards and you're going to be putting an augment on one side and an um is it, what's, what's it called what's the other thing called is it an instrument or a, da, 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 da. accessory yeah accessory so let me see if i can find something do, 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 do. so like here let me see if i can make a machine right now to show you guys what it would look like maybe i should have been a bit more prepared okay accessory augment let's see if i can find a device now do, 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 do. Come on, a practical device. Okay, this one's probably not going to fit together well. Cause so here's what it would kind of look like, but you would need to match up all the parts. So you are trying to create these machines together. So you see how the gears match up here, but it's this card is missing this thing to connect it. And on this side, it's uh, missing the top part to connect it. And the, no, actually on here, and it's missing the gear. So you're going to try and create these machines in your workshop that have an accessory on one side and an augment on the other and the device in the middle and if you have that machine in your workshop then you'll be able to activate all the parts of the card so there is a top part of the card which you can activate under certain circumstances um, if it allows you to and then there's the full construct part at the bottom of the card which you can activate on your turn if you have a fully constructed machine so this game, I thought it was good. Um, we were a bit unclear on some of the rules. Like the rule book was a little bit unclear about whether, um, about like the way it was worded, my friend couldn't tell whether you needed both parts of the machine to connect it. And I was like, yeah, of course you do. Like how would this connect without this part being here as well. So that's the way we played it, but we did think that the wording was a little bit off the way it was written. Um, also, you can only have one fully, one machine in your workshop at a time. So as you're trying to purchase cards that match up, it's, you know, it gets, it's a little bit hard. It's a little bit drawn out to try to get the kind of machine you want. And of course you can break down the machine and then create a new machine. Um, but you know, since not all the cards have all the parts that you need, you just kind of have to wait. I, I liked it though. Um, I thought it was fun. Um, I just was not, a f one thing I was not a fan of was the way you keep track of your sparks. So, but that can be remedied. I think we can come up with some way to do that. So it comes with this like these cards where you can keep track of your sparks by matching up like for example like 
this would be like you have 10 spark you would have a one and a zero you would just use this like clock thingy and keep track of your spark that way not really a huge fan of that i put sleeves on the cards because um i did not think that the cards were that great of quality but otherwise you know but i really like the artwork i like the theme of the game and i like you know the funny machine parts you can the machines you can come up with so when you put them together you know you can come up with these cool machines like you know like this would be like um what would this be called butter gun with wood paneling so there's like different cool stuff you can come up with um but yeah as far as a deck building go game goes i would say it's not like the one that i would reach for like first when i want to play a deck building game like i said i need to get a few rule clarifications um and you can increase or decrease the amount of spark in order to you know play this game so you can decide whether you know you want to make the spark a little bit higher or lower and it also has these other cards which um you know add some uh, variability to the game so you can have one of these in effect so like we played with this one which said um win condition get to 100 and rules at the end of each player's turn that player melts a card in the marketplace so melting a card means that that card goes away so the marketplace has like a number i think it has six cards in it and that you can buy with gold coins that you have so like any deck building game you want to get rid of your less valuable cards that only have like one gold on them and nothing else and you want to try to build up your hand with better cards um so like any deck building game that part was good which i liked um but yeah i think it could use a little bit of tweaking here and there but uh, again i liked it i thought it was a good game um let me see did i yeah yeah so like any deck building game you know you have your draw phase your discard phase etc so yeah and i really like the artwork so i like you know steampunk artwork and i think the artwork in this is pretty unique so i like that yeah yeah, so like, yeah. So, you know, if you're into steampunk and you like deck building games, then this is a game I would recommend. You know, I wouldn't say it's like a must have, but if you enjoy those two things, then definitely check it out. And I do wonder how it would be at a higher player count. So, so yeah, so that is Widget Ridge. Um, so yeah, so, you know, again, my, my friend felt the same way about it. Like we both liked it, but we weren't like super crazy about it, but we decided if someone else you know wants to play it, we would be happy to play it again. Um, so yeah, so that was Widget Ridge. Let's talk about Radlands. So I received a review copy at PAX Unplugged. So this is a two player game. Uh, designed by Daniel Pichnik, art by Lena Cosette, Kos Damien Memoliti, and Manny Tremley, uh, published by Roxley. So this is a hand management take that kind of game, and you have action points to spend. The cool thing about this game is, so you're going to have your, um, I don't remember what they're called, so you're going to have like your camps or base camps or whatever at the bottom. The way the game is set up, you're going to have these at the bottom, and then you're going to be putting cards on top of them, and the people that you're putting on top of them are like your army i guess your gang or whatever who are going to be protecting your camps and you're going to be spending action points trying to activate these various people so when we played we played with the initial recommended setup um, and then the different people you can kind of get so you're basically trying to um you know i guess it's a the game describes it as wanting to play cards that you know will are very compatible with each other will like you know enhance each other and uh yeah you know card synergies and stuff like that um we really liked it we thought it was really good um in fact i liked it so much that i ordered the deluxe copy of it um so different cards will allow you to do different things so in this game like you um here are the different like so you can destroy you can damage so of course you're trying to destroy the other players base camps and once you've done that you will win the game when you destroy all three of their their camps um you can injure you can restore draw there's water water is what you need for action points basically um you can gain a punk punks basically when you gain a punk you can like put a card on top of your like column this way face it'll be with the punk side up so that protects as like a shield to your camp um so yeah so there's different things you can do it's pretty cool um there's like event cards so you can um try to you know there are certain events that will affect both players or one player and you can try to use those to your advantage there's some cool there was like some camps here which i thought was interesting like so this one you would destroy this card before starting the game so i think the reason that that 
is in effect is because uh, based on which camps you have, that tells you how many cards you get to draw at the beginning of the game, I think. So because this one has the most cards you can draw at the very beginning when you start the game, maybe that's why you destroy it. But that's the only one I saw where you actually destroy the card, which I thought was really interesting. I didn't play with that one. Um, so there is luck involved, you know, with drawing. My problem was that I was not getting any cards that would allow me to restore cards. So my opponent had a card that would allow him to restore and I had a card that would allow me to use one of my opponent's cards abilities. So I kept on spending money to try water to try and do that um, whenever I needed to restore a card. But yeah, I mean, the artwork in this game is seriously awesome. I think it's a really good game, but again, you know, the card with the card draws, there's a bit of um, randomness. So if you don't mind that too much, then it would be fine. Um, if you like kind of games like where you are kind of like trying to destroy stuff, you know, then I think you would enjoy this. I could see myself maybe getting a little bit bored of it, so I don't think I want to play it like continuously like all the time. I think I would want to play it maybe like once in a while to keep it fresh and fun. Um, but yeah, the artwork is really cool. So yeah, I do like this game. I'm not sure what else to say about it. I know people have been really talking about it a lot and I'm not sure if I have much more to add myself. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, you have action points you're spending, basically your water and yeah, just trying to destroy other people's camps. Um, but yeah, it's really cool that the way you can kind of combine cards to try to make them work together and the order in, the order in which you do stuff. So, you know, you kind of need to figure out the best order and try to be smart about that. So yeah, I liked Radlands and I'm looking forward to getting my deluxe copy because I think the deluxe copy has cards that are supposed to be like waterproof and like bend proof and damage proof. So I'm really curious to see what those cards are like. Um, I don't think if you want to keep, if you do get the retail edition, which is this edition, I did try sleeving these cards, but they would not fit unless you remove the insert. And I didn't want to remove this insert because I kind of liked it. So I decided I would keep it unsleeved. So that's something to consider. Oh, and these are the tokens you have that would keep track of like your water. And even in the retail edition, these are really nice and chunky. Um, and then you have black tokens, which will keep track of like your different characters that you need. Um, so yeah, the nice chunky tokens, even in the retail edition, like the cardboard is really chunky. Okay, so that is Radlands. I feel like if you enjoy games like Dice Throne and stuff like that, then you would enjoy Radlands. Um, let's talk about Mountain Goats. So Mountain Goats is designed by Stefan Risthaus, art by Anka Gavril and Daniel Profiri, um, published by Board Game Tables for two to four players. So this is a uh, dice rolling King of the Hill game. So you're going to have different columns of mountains. Let me just show you. So you're going to have like a column that has uh, fives and you're going to need to rule so you'll have one whole column of this five and at the top you're going to have point tokens then you're going to have a whole column of sixes and then a column of sevens eight nines and going all the way up to ten so you are going to be rolling dice on your turn and you're going to have a mount uh, goat at the bottom of each column and you are trying to get your goat to the top of the mountain so you are going to roll four dice and then you can group them in any way you want in order to move your goat up the mountain so for example if i rolled a six and a four and like a five and something else like i could use a six and a four to go up one space on the ten and then whatever else to go up one space on something else if i have sometimes you'll have dice that just go to waste um, if you roll more than one one, then you can flip one of the dice to any face value you want. That's the only mitigation that is in this game. So if you have consistently bad rolls, you're probably not going to do very well, which I was in the beginning of the game. I played a two player game of it. My sister kept on having these amazing rolls and I kept on having really bad rolls. Um, so these are the point tokens. You're going to have a certain number of point tokens at the top of each mountain. The game end trigger is when, once uh, the point tokens for three of the mountains have been depleted, three of the columns, or if all of the bonus tokens have been depleted. So there's a number of bonus tiles, token point token thingies, and the way to get those is if you complete one set of all the point tokens, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that would be one set, then you can 
get one of these bonus token thingies, point token thingies, and there's only a handful, like a little few, a couple of those. Um, and if those get depleted, that's another game and trigger. And they have like higher values. I think the highest value was like 15 and then it goes down to 14, I think, something like that. Um, so yeah, so that's the game. There's a, you know, a fair bit of luck involved with the dice rolls. If you like goats, you might enjoy it. If you like, you know, King of the Hill type games, it's just a nice little filler game. It's not something that I would, you know, say has a lot of strategy and like it's a must have game or something like that. Definitely not. But it's a nice little filler game if you're looking for that. And yeah, it's cute. Um, you know, it's got goats in it. My little sister kept on saying she loves it. Like she kept on saying over and over, I love this game. I love this game. Um, but you know, she's not like, like a board gamer gamer. So, um, so maybe that's why she enjoyed it so much. I thought it was good. I mean, I liked it again, good filler game that I might bring to, um, game nights, but for a filler game, it will be a little bit long though. Um, especially if you get into higher player counts, waiting for people to roll their dice and move their mountain goats up. And also if someone gets to the top of a column and there's someone else's goat already there, that goat will be knocked down to the very bottom then. And if you are already at the top of a mountain and you roll that column's number again, and you can just collect another point token. You don't have to move your goat. Um, but yeah, it might be a little bit long for a filler game, but it's, an, it's a nice game. The next game I'll talk about, which I know is really hard for people to find. I actually bought it at PAX Unplugged in 2019, is Porto. So this is designed by Orlando Sa, art by Luis Levy Lima, triple uh, L published by Mebo Games for one to four players. This is a hand management tile placement game. It's really big, so I'm just going to throw up a picture of it. Um, but yeah, you have this beautiful board and you are just trying to build up houses on it. Let me just show you, like this part of the board is my favorite, the dragon. And let me just see if I can pop it open a little bit just to show you where the houses would go. So yeah, you can see where the buildings are going to be. So you're going to have tiles that you are going to be wanting to place there. So on your turn, you can do one of two things. You can either draw two cards with a value, maximum value of three. So there's going to be a marketplace with cards in them. And here are some of the cards and they're going to be in different colors. So the maximum value of cards you can draw is three. So for example, if these were all the cards available in the market, let me just see if I can find a three. So you could draw one three card, or is that a three? Yeah, you could draw one three card, or you could draw like a one and a two, or you could draw three ones. Um, and then the market would get replenished. There are, are public objectives, which you are also trying to complete. So the way this game works is like you are, if you're going to play cards on your turn, you're going to play two cards. And one of those cards is going to be the color of the tiles you are putting down. And the other one will be the number of tiles that you are putting down. So in this instance, I could either put down uh, two purples or I could put down one green. And so you start each building with a door. You cannot have buildings that are, the same color adjacent to each other. And the way you score points is pretty cool. So you'll get a point. There's going to be point tokens at the bottom of each column. So if you are the first one to start that building, you will get those points. And then you move that point token to the top of a building, any building you want. And then whoever finishes that building with the point token at the top would get those points once, once they complete it. Um, so you're going to get a point for each floor you place and then a point for each floor that's adjacent to each floor you pay, place. So you really want to try to like pay attention to try to, so if you see a place that has like one empty column and there's two already buildings built to the side of it, that's a building a column that you definitely want to be the person who starts building a building there. So you'll get the points at the bottom for being the first one to build a door, then you'll move that somewhere else, and then you'll get the points for the floors you place and then the points adjacent. And then of course there's public objectives that you're trying to get. Um, so I'll show you some of the public objective cards. So for example, this one would say you need to play two blue cards to get it. This one says you need to complete a green building to get it, just need to be the one who completes it. This one says you have to put down two purple floors to get those points. You score the points immediately once you complete one of these objectives and you take the card and put it in front of you face down because they will serve as a tiebreaker in case there is a tie. There was one game where, oh my God, my mom and I, it was like a three player game and we tied and we had to go, we went through all the tiebreakers and we were still tied at the end of it until finally it said, okay, the tiebreaker is that the person who was last in turn order wins. 
and so my mom eventually got it because I think I was first in turn order but we, but we went through like three different tiebreakers in that instance so yeah so I think a game like that you know it's pretty good when you um, are that close in scoring the game end trigger is once you have put down a certain number of roof tiles so at the top here is where the roof tiles are going to be and for player count and then you will finish that round and then have one more round um, yeah, so it's a really good game. We love this game. It's like a family favorite of ours. Um, you know, my mom is not a board gamer, but this is a game she really enjoys and she gets super competitive about. So I know it's really hard to find when it appeared on Board Game Bliss maybe like a year ago. It got sold out super quickly. Um, you know, it's a game that I've been posting about since 2019 because I love it. Um, so if you can somehow get your hands on this, I do recommend it. It's a beautiful, great family tile placement game. So yeah, so that is Porto. Um, the next game I will talk about is Horrified American Monsters Edition. So this game is designed by Michael Mulvihill, artist Victor Maristani, I'm totally butchering these names, published by Ravensburger, for one to five players. <coughs> Sorry, got something stuck in my throat. Okay, so I have played the original Horrified many times, um, and I was really worried about buying this game. I had heard so many criticisms that it's just a reskin of Horrified. So, you know, and I read some really bad reviews about it, like, you know, people just complaining about it, complaining that there's, you know, an error, like where the sheriff station is called a police station at one point, like just one editing error. So I will say I loved it. Uh, you know. Uh, first of all, I don't think Horrified is like a super amazing game, but for what it is, it's a lot of fun. Like you're, you know, defeating monsters. It's a cooperative game and I've said repeatedly I'm not a fan of cooperative games, but Horrified is one of my favorite cooperative games to play because I just think it's fun. So let me show you the board for this one. So this is the American Edition board. So I like the American Edition board. I think it looks different enough. I like the aesthetic. It's like totally a very Americana nostalgic aesthetic, which I love. Um, even the tokens, oops, I'm totally bending this the wrong way and I'm going to break it. Uh, okay. Um, even the tokens in this game remind me of like, you know, the Americana, American aesthetic. Oh, I like this bag, by the way. I really like that it comes with this bag for the tokens. Um, so yeah, so here are like the tokens. They're shaped this way, which reminds me of like an old diner sign or something you would see like, you know, on a motorcyclist or something like that. I don't know. So I like that. Um... I like the miniatures. I think they're pretty cool. I accidentally used the wrong miniature when I was playing last night over video chat. So this is a great game to play over video chat, which is what I did last night. Um, so yeah, and so yeah, so you have different monsters in this game, of course. I did not think it was reskin. I played, so last night we played with the Ozark Howler and the Jersey Devil, and I definitely did not think it was a reskin. Oh my god. So we only played with two monsters since it was my first time playing this version, and it was my friend's second time, I think, or third time. He's played it a number of times. Um, so we decided on which monsters to play based on the fact that it was my first time playing this version. So the Ozark Howler we de defeated, um, which was, you know, not too difficult. But the Jersey Devil, oh my god, like we kept on having to, there's the, these round tokens, you're trying to, so you pull out all of the citizens, the people from the monster deck, and you have them at the top, and you're trying to find out which of those citizens the Jersey Devil is actually disguised as. So you're trying to look at the artwork on the citizens' cards, look at what they're wearing, look at the stuff behind them, and you're trying to eliminate, you know, by process of elimination, who the monster is. And oh my god, so we kept on having our round tokens that would flip over, that would tell us, okay, this is the item we need to look for in these pictures. And then the Jersey Devil, his like special ability, if you roll the exclamation point is that the token you just revealed has to go away and you have to like draw a new token and uh, reveal that at some point so all the work you did just becomes undone basically and that happened to us I believe twice or three times where all of our work would just be undone um, after a certain point once you reach the once you're down to only three tokens he can't do that anymore obviously but um 
we won at the very last minute. If there had been one more monster card drawn, we would have lost because we were trying to defeat this Jersey Devil. So and yeah, and then we played on like easy mode. So that was just two monsters and it was down to the very last minute basically for us to, you know, beat these monsters. But yeah, I think it's different enough. I do not think it's a reskin. Even the Ozark Howler, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's a reskin with the two monsters we played. I think the monsters are different enough. The aesthetic is different enough that you can can feel justified in owning both editions. So I am not regretful that I bought this. I was really scared when I bought it based on all the reviews I was hearing about it, but I like it. I think it's good. So if you can find it and you are a fan of Horrified, you know, it's a fun game. I would say go for it then. Um, so I think those are all the games I played. Yep. So I'm not backing anything at the moment. So I'm currently extremely broke. <laughs> so even though my brother-in-law gifted us a trip to Las Vegas, I spent quite a bit of money on food and stuff over there. And I'm going to be paying off my credit cards for quite some time to come. So I don't think I'll be backing anything anytime soon. So this section of the video is probably going to be empty for quite some time, unless something comes up that I'm like super duper excited about and feel like I have to have the Kickstarter edition. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'm probably not gonna be backing anything for a while. I haven't had an active campaign in my Kickstarter section for like, I think like at least a week now, maybe two weeks. Um, yeah, so I thought I would talk about games that I have received. Oh, but before I do that, let me talk about games that I'm calling. So I don't know if I mentioned this one before. I'm calling Lisboa, um, designed by Vital Lacerda. I don't know if I've talked about it before, but um, after playing Weather Machine, I decided I do not need more than one Vital Lacerda game in my collection. Um, I've heard Lisboa is more difficult than Weather Machine and the fact that Weather Machine just kind of hurt my brain and was a lot for me. <laughs> I think I would be fine with having just one Vital Lacerda game in my collection, which I think is going to be just Weather Machine. I like the theme of Weather Machine better. I like the artwork of it better, um, the components. Um, you know, I thought it would be cool to have Lisboa since I have a couple of Portugal themed games like I have Porto, which I, which I just discussed. I have Coimbra, I have Cafe, I have, what else do I have? Um, Azul. So I have a couple of like Portugal themed games. So I thought it would be cool to have like a whole Portugal themed game section, but like, no, I'm never going to play Lisboa. I unboxed it. It's the Kickstarter deluxe edition, which I bought myself. I unboxed it. I sleeved the cards. I have the Queens variant, which I got from Mercado de Lisboa in this box, which I then sold off because I then had no interest in playing it once I received it, um, which is why I'm trying to be more selective about games that I back. Like at the time I was like, I have to have Mercado de Lisboa de Las Boa and then once it arrived I just had no interest whatsoever in playing it for some reason. Um, so yes yeah, so I'm going to try to be more selective about games I back because it's getting out of control and I have to stop just throwing away money on games which you know I don't need. Um, so yeah, so I'm selling Lisboa. So if that's a game that was on your wish list, you know, get in touch with me. It's listed on BGG. Um, I know shipping is insanely expensive these days, but maybe we can work something out. Um, you know, I'm someone who does travel often to New York City and like Rochester, New York and stuff. So, you know, if you're interested, message me, maybe we can work something out. So yeah, so I'm definitely back uh, calling Lisboa. Um, so let, let me talk about games that I have received now. So I thought I would make that a new section. So a review copy I received recently is A War of Whispers. I had talked about this game in a video uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. This is a uh, area control kind of like social deduction kind of game and I absolutely loved it. I'm not going to go into detail right now but um, this deluxe edition comes with these nice like chunky pieces your thrones um yeah it's just it's a really great game i absolutely loved it and i just knew i really had to have a copy of this so i reached out asking them for a review copy so that i could talk about it in more detail the next time i play it which is what i will do so i'm actually going to put it away right now but if you are into area control games and social deduction kind of games um, I would say this is a great one because it's kind of both combined and so there's definitely a deduction there's a deduction element to this game there's kind of like a betting hedging um, you know element to it where you're trying to see you know uh, you're trying to move around tokens and trying to 
kind of guess who is going to be in more control of something so that you can try to win. I really loved it. I thought it was super great. Um, the next game I received is a game I backed on Kickstarter, which is Caper Europe. Now, this game is going to be really hard for me to pull out of the sleeve because I sleeved my coat. Oh, okay, maybe not that hard. But it's like, it's not sitting fully flat on the box because I sleeved the cards and the sleeves do not fit into the absolutely beautiful insert that this game comes with. So like this pops up over the edge because the cars just do not fit. Um, so I had to like cram them in and you're actually going to see that the cards are like now bent because I crammed them in. <laughs> so the insert is absolutely gorgeous, but this, it does not fit sleeved cards. And that really, really upsets me. Um, okay, maybe maybe I'm a little bit over dramatic about that, but, <laughs> but, but it does upset me. It's like, you know, I really wish publishers would take into consideration um, the fact that, you know, people do want to sleeve their cards. They want to make these games, which they are investing a lot of money in last longer. And by not having an insert that sleeved cards fit into just, it hurts. <laughs> so it's like us sleevers are not being taken into consideration. So yeah, so you have to like squeeze the box in like then, and this has already gotten warped because it's now not like here, you can kind of see it here maybe. So it's not like on its proper crease now because I am squeezing it over this box to make it fit. Oh no, I forgot the rule book. God damn it. Okay. So yeah, so those are the two games that have come in recently. Um, oh yeah, there was one more game that came in, but I'm going to be doing a video of it soon enough. It's a game coming to Kickstarter. It's called Hike. It's about racing sled dogs. So yeah, you guys can be on the lookout for Hike. It's got a uh, really beautiful artwork of huskies, which I absolutely love. I love huskies. Okay, so now, now, now let's go on to questions and commentary because I skipped a question from um, two weeks ago. Three weeks ago, two weeks ago. So this is going to be a little bit long. As a topic question, what do you think about sustainable production in the board game industry? Recently, I heard of a game that was splitting manufacturing up into multiple locations to minimize the cost of freight. It got me thinking about the necessity of having large amounts of plastic miniatures inside a box and also about spot UV and other treatments that make the outside of a box unrecyclable as well. I'm all for buying a nicely designed game, but if that product is still around 500 or 1000 years from now and is still unrecyclable, that's horrible. If you combine that across all board games manufactured each year, it leaves me wondering about what changes we should ask for. Is it enough that it, it, it is enough that it makes me wonder about which games I should buy? Have you any idea if this is something that the industry has awareness of or is working on? Is it just something that is working on my mind? It is just something that is working on my mind. Um, yeah, fantastic question. I wish I were an expert in this. Um, as someone who you know claims to be an environmentalist or cares about the environment, I did not know that spot UV makes something unrecyclable. And I feel really bad that I did not know that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I wonder if this is something that Gamma, the Game Association manufacturer, the Game Manufacturers Association can take up as a cause. I think it is something that they should take up as a cause. I mean, if this is an organization that claims to, you know, kind of represent the board game industry or represent the interests of manufacturers and publishers and designers and uh, content creators, then this is clearly something that they should be looking into and discussing and, you know, trying to encourage publishers about. I did not know that Spot UV is not make something unrecyclable. That's terrible. Um, I do agree about the plastic miniatures and stuff. Like I think, you know, with so many games just bloated with so many plastic miniatures. So I'm a bit biased because I am not a minis fan in general. I go for meeples. Um, but yeah, um, you know, like, you know, with the number of games you see for sale, like used games, maybe we should be encouraged. Maybe, hmm, I don't know if this would drive up prices and then there would be a whole nother issue, but like what if board game manufacturers just committed to publishing a certain number of games, but then you would have like the wealthy people who are the ones who are able to afford those games and maybe get them first. I don't know, like what's a, what's a way that, well, how could you, solve this issue like i don't know if you like created or if you you know said okay board game manufacturers or publishers you know create only 
X number of games that you are publishing so that, you know, they get played and then they go to the resale market. So then people, other people who want them, but then you don't know if they would go to the resale market because what if people really love that game? Like, oh, oh my gosh. I don't know. God, that's a really hard one. But okay, the spot UV thing, like the fact that those are not recyclable. Yeah, maybe we need to do away with spot UV. I had no idea. In fact, um, I had um, business cards made for PAX Unplugged, which I absolutely adored. I thought they were the nicest cards. I got a billion compliments on my business cards. I think people were like just in love with my business card and it had spot UV on both sides. Um, on one side, it had my logo which had some of the gears in spot UV and on the other side it had my name and some elephants in spot UV. Um, did not know that that is not recyclable. Um, yeah, is there any environmentalist like expert who is watching who can give suggestions? I think maybe, you know, Gamma should hire a consultant and figure out some kind of a solution. I'm certainly not an expert, but it does worry me. I do think it's something that we should care about. So I guess that's all I can really say about it. I feel like it's something we should care about. I feel like humans, we as humans have a responsibility to care about this planet. I know I'm probably going way too personal right now, but like one of the reasons I absolutely do not want children personally is because I feel like we've already destroyed the planet enough. You know, and I, I'm a part of that, of course. I mean, look at the amount of board games I have, which, you know, if I die before any of my family members do, they're going to have to figure out what the hell to do with all these board games. Maybe they can donate them. Maybe they can sell them. I don't know. Um, but yeah, like uh, one of the reasons I don't want children is because I feel like the planet has gone to absolute shit. And it's like, why would I want to bring life into this world when we've destroyed the planet? I feel like it's overpopulated. I feel like people need to work more on adopting kids who need to be adopted. There's plenty of kids who need loving homes, need loving parents. Um, so, you know, when I see people, I know I'm gonna probably get a lot of shit for this, but like when I see people having more than two children, I'm like, why? Like one, I can understand, you know, you want one child to have a playmate, so you'll have two children, but beyond two, like, I'm like, why do you need more than two children? Like, you know, I feel like we as humans have an ethical obligation to minimize our reproductivity and, you know, keep the human population low. Of course, you know, there's so much that goes into this, right? So when you look at lesser developed countries, countries where the um, human life expectancy maybe is not high, countries where people are relying on, you know, marrying off their daughters for a dowry or whatever so that they can, you know, there, there's so much that goes into this. And, you know, I know it's not going to be across the board where you can say, you know, well, you shouldn't have had that many kids because, you know, obviously there's families that do need that many children to help sustain their families, to help, you know, have their children work and helps, you know, feed the family. I don't know, like I'm not an expert and I never claim to be an expert. All I know is that this planet is suffering a lot and we as humans do have an obligation to try to make it better. And I think it's a fantastic question and I hope that this is something that Gamma will take up. And, you know, I, I know Stefan Brassad, so maybe I'll reach out to him and see if that's like an, an initiative that Gamma would be, you know, interested in or has done something about um that's that's an excellent question if you guys are anyone who's watching if you know anything about this have any kind of recommendations or suggestions just please leave them in the comments below and maybe i can pass them on to gamma i am a, currently a member of gamma i do need to renew my membership it's an it's just very expensive it's 300 dollars per year i joined gamma so that i could voice my concerns about someone who's running for the board who i thought should not be on the board but i think i will continue my membership just so i can have a voice um, because otherwise I feel like my voice won't be heard. Um, so yeah, so those were all the questions I have. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about Las Vegas, which was again really great. It was my first time being there. Um, you know, if this won't, well, I'll talk about the gaming goat first and then I can talk about the rest of the trip so anyone who wants to watch stuff just about gaming goat can watch and then tune up. Um, so yeah, so I got to meet Jeff Bergeron and Matthew Ryan and uh, some other people from the Gaming Goat, which was, you know, wonderful. Um, so their store is not located on the Strip, so you need to, I needed to take an Uber to get there. Um, but once I got there, they were kind and uh, met me at the store and then picked me up and we went to a restaurant together and Jeff treated us to a really wonderful meal. Um, this was on Christmas Eve, actually. So it was really cool to spend Christmas Eve with them. It felt like being with, you know, people who... 
you know, uh, I'm, I felt very com comfortable with. Like Jeff is someone who stood up for me during the whole Helena Burnt Island thing when I was being, um, I felt discriminated against and treated badly and being just unfriended left and right by people because I spoke out against Burnt Island for, you know, having double standards when it comes to Palestinian Lives Matter and Burnt, um, Burnt and Black Lives Matter. Um, so yeah, so when I spoke out against Burnt Island Games, Jeff was someone who supported me. And so, yeah, so it was, you know, I personally know he is, not you know, not racist. Um, you know, the way he treated me was very respectful. I, you know, the way they all did was very respectful and I had a great time with them and I'm really glad I got to meet up with them. And, you know, it was just a lot of fun. We just had a lot of laughs and, you know, talked a little bit about industry stuff, but mostly just like, you know, just fun stuff. Like, you know, we were just talking about our own personal lives and stuff like that. So it was like meeting up with friends, it, you know, it wasn't like we were conspiring or anything, like all these dangerous people together. Like I know Jeff posted a photo just like, kind of like making a joke about how it's the three of the five most wanted BGG list, <laughs> you know, meeting up together, but um, it was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so I'm really glad I got to meet up with them and I hope I will get to meet up with them again at some point. Um, they have a lot of cool games lined up. Oh, and their store, oh my God, their store is amazing. So it is beautiful, it is, it's beautiful. It's like you walk in and it's so neat and clean. Everything is organized so beautifully. It's a huge store, it's got so many games. I actually picked up uh, Living Forest from there, which is a game I wanted to check out at PAX Unplugged and I did not believe would be at my own uh, FLGS, Friendly Local Gaming Store. And then I picked up another game from there called On the Bus or something like that, or Let's Make a Bus Route or something like that. It's a Sashi game, um, which I've never seen at my own local gaming store, so I picked that up as well. Um, but yeah, his store is really gorgeous. It has a fantastic selection of games, which I already knew because I've bought games from him online. Um, yeah, and, and he backs a lot of Kickstarters, he supports a lot of Kickstarters and has a lot of the deluxe editions of Kickstarters. So also that's another reason I know like I don't need to back a game if I'm really tight on money right now. I just like reach out to Jeff and I'm like, hey, are you backing this? <laughs> so, so that way I know if I can't afford it right now, like when it comes out, I'll be able to buy it from him. So yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Um, rest of Las Vegas, you know, it was really cool to be there during Christmas and see all the Christmas decorations everywhere. The photo I posted on my YouTube page was, uh, and the community section was from, taken from the Bellagio, I believe. Um, amazing food in Las Vegas, like did not know that Vegas would have such an amazing food scene. Um, my favorite part was of course going to Red Rock Canyon. So on Christmas morning, we took a tour of Red Rock Canyon, which is about like maybe half an hour away from Vegas. Absolutely beautiful, natural place. Absolutely loved it. Um, got in a ton of walking in Vegas. Um, I'm not a gambler, but I did, my, you know, my brother-in-law encouraged me to gamble. So I spent $15 gambling and won 28 cents and never again. I just, you know, no offense to anyone who likes the slot machines, but I just could not understand why people are just sitting there pushing buttons. It's completely random. You're just pushing buttons and hoping that you get something from it. Like, I feel like I even have more control. Okay, I know this is stupid and makes no sense, but I feel like I have even more control when I'm filling out like actual lottery sheets, like slips where I pick the numbers I want and hope they come out. Because with that, at least you can kind of see, okay, I know this probably is absolute bullshit, but like I feel like numbers that have already come out in the past, like tend to come out again in the next few days. So based on that, I can pick numbers that I've seen come up frequently and be like, okay, maybe there's a good chance that they'll come up again. Um, okay maybe I know that's utter bullshit as well but like I just feel like there's more control over lottery than there is a slot machine and these people just did not look happy like sitting at a slot machine like even if they're with loved ones just like mindlessly pushing a button over and over and over hoping that you get something from it like I just could not understand the why anyone would want to do that um but interestingly enough we got there on Thursday the Thursday before Christmas and left on Monday and Christmas day was by far the busiest day at the casinos. Like the slot machines, the tables, like there were so many people gambling on Christmas day. So I was talking to my friend last night while we were playing Horrified over a video chat and I was like, why is that? Like, why was Christmas day so busy? Like it just didn't make sense to me. And then he explained, you know, that people who, 
are not a fan of the holidays, you know, maybe they live in Las Vegas and they don't have family around, they come to, uh, sorry, they live in Los Angeles and they don't have family around, they come to Vegas for the day on Christmas Day so that they don't have to spend it alone. A lot of people tend to go to Vegas because they know it's not like a family location or whatever, so they go there to, you know, not be depressed on the holidays. Like, none of that occurred to me, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, so yeah, so I guess if I were alone and did not have anyone to celebrate the holidays with, I can see why people would go to Vegas. Um, I did attend some shows. I attended Cirque du Soleil. I attended the O show, the water show, which I fell asleep during a lot. Um, I slept through some really good parts of, according to my family. Um, and then I attended the Mystere show, which was really good. Um, I really enjoyed Mystere. I did fall asleep during a couple of parts. Um, I tend to fall asleep a lot while watching TV or in the movie theater when it's like even at home, I fall asleep like so many times on my couch. Um, so yeah, so I knew it was going to happen. Mystere was really cool. I feel like it had more acrobatic acts in it, more trapeze acts in it than O did. So I really loved that. Um, I think it's just incredible how they can do the things they do and I hope that they are paid well for it. I hope that they have at least salaries of at least a hundred thousand because I feel like they make a lot of money from these shows and these people are putting their lives at risk doing these incredible acts to entertain people. So I hope they are getting paid really well for it. Um, what else? I attended Area 15, Meow Wolf, uh, based on many people's recommendations. So I remember when I asked on Twitter, like, what should I do in Vegas? A lot of people commented Meow Wolf. I had no idea what the hell Meow Wolf was. So I'd respond like, quack dog, like what? Like, <laughs> I didn't know what Meow Wolf was. So uh, I went to the grocery store. Someone had posted a commercial for this grocery store, a Mega Mart. And I was like, why the hell would I want to go to a grocery store? I thought it was going to be like a regular grocery store. And I was like, no, you guys haven't seen Wegmans, which is a grocery store we have here local to Ithaca, Rochester. The flagship store is actually in Rochester, New York, where I'm headed later today for New Year's Eve. Um, so I was like, why would I want to go to a grocery store when I have like one of the most amazing grocery stores in the world where I live? Like seriously, if you guys ever come to upstate New York, you have to go to Wegmans. There is no grocery store like Wegmans. It is seriously the best. Like even when I lived in London, the thing I missed the most, one of the things I missed the most was Wegmans grocery store. So anyway, enough babbling. I went to Omega Mart not knowing it was like an interactive art experience. So you go in this grocery store and it turns out you have some kind of like mission to do. Like you're either part of the store, you're part of the staff or you're part of the resistance and you're trying to figure out. So you have this like employee card and you're like scanning it in different sections, trying to do different things and you end up like discovering these amazing rooms. Basically, it's like a huge playground for adults. It was fantastic. Like it was amazing. Um, there's like this place local to us called the Discovery Center where I went as a kid. So I was in Girl Scouts for one year when I was a little kid and we had a sleepover at the Discovery Center and it had like these tunnels like in the sky that you could walk through and there were certain troops who got to sleep in those tunnels and I was so freaking jealous because I got to sleep in a room which was absolutely boring and had nothing cool in it so all the people who got to sleep in these tunnels as a part of that sleepover I was just so jealous of them but this at Area 15, this Omega Mart reminded me of that. Like, it's like a playground for adults. You have these cool tunnels you can climb into, these cool rooms you can explore with these amazing fluorescent and black lights. It's just incredible. There's just so much to do and see. There's just so many like awesome rooms for you to explore. I'm pretty sure I must have missed some. Um, yeah, just so much fun. There's a slide you can go down, which was super fast, and I actually like screamed on it. Um, it was a lot of fun. I absolutely loved it. So then, in the rest of the Area 15 building, um, there's other stuff you can do. There's like virtual reality stuff. There's what else is there? There was this like uh, zip lining thing that I wanted to do that would go around the whole Area 15. But unfortunately, the Omega Mart is the only thing we ended up doing. So our plan was to go back another day. Unfortunately, the other day we decided to go back on timing got really messed up and we ended up going to the Haunted Museum, which I do not recommend at all. So the Haunted Museum is, you know, described as being one of the scariest places in America. This guy, Zach Bagran, Bagran, I don't know what his name is. He goes around collecting items from around the world that he believes are haunted and possessed by spirits and have caused bad things to happen. And so you get a tour of this house that has all of these items in it, including the Dybbuk box, which is like this Jewish um, thing where, you know, it's a box that contains like evil spirits or whatever. So he has like this Dybbuk box, which um, some movies and stuff were based on. 
I was not scared at all. It felt like, you know, it was just, I felt like it was a waste of money. Like I expected to be scared. I expected to go here and get scared. And you know, the way they described it in their advertisements, like, oh, people like, you know, feel like this, they feel like that, whatever. Like, no, like you're just getting a tour of this building that has like a bunch of crap in it, like a bunch of artifacts and like items that he's picked up. And you see a video of him. There's one video of him where he's talking about Post Malone, how Post Malone came over and they were looking at the Dybbuk box and at one point he says Zach says that he got Post Malone says that he saw Zach get pushed against a wall and then he was like in this kind of state and then he went out into the parking lot he cried and then they stared into each other's eyes for like half an hour you see the footage of him being pushed against the wall he is like literally not pushed against the wall he like takes a step back he does not slam into the wall he just takes one little step back and he like acts like he's like all like whatever and then that's it and i'm like dude it was like laughable like we were laughing at it like all these videos like talking about these scary moments we were like laughing at them we we're like okay like we didn't experience anything so i thought that was a total waste of money each ticket which you know i, I paid for a lot of the entertainment since my brother treated us to the resort and the airline tickets so i paid for a lot of the entertainment and i was really pissed that i spent like two hundred dollars buying us all tickets for this house which was not you know did not scare any of us and then I could have been at area 15 doing all the other cool stuff I could have been like fighting zombies and this like this virtual reality reality thing instead of like you know not being scared in this house so yeah so my recommendation would be don't go to area 15 you will see a lot of great review uh, not sorry don't go to the haunted museum is what I mean you will see a lot of great reviews about it and I kind of like you know um liking it to people who spend a lot of money on board games which i have totally done and then convince themselves that they like that board game because they don't want to have buyer's remorse so i think a lot of the really good reviews of the haunted museum were because people have convinced themselves that they thought it was a great experience because they did not want to regret spending so much money going there at least that's my own personal opinion i know i'm probably pissing off a lot of people but that's my personal opinion so my personal opinion is if you ever go to las vegas my recommendation is do not go to the haunted museum go to area 15 at least twice because there's so much to do there and i wish i had done more there i wish i could go back and go to area 15 again i know that uh dice tower west convention is happening in las vegas that's in march i cannot afford to go um but you know um you know maybe someday in the future and then i would get to go to area 15 again i think i've covered everything about my trip i think Hmm. Yeah, so today I am headed to Rochester since it is New Year's Eve tonight. Um, I might go to Millennium Games again tomorrow. I think that's it. So yeah, so I'm hoping I get to play a number of games to discuss with you guys. I'm going to be covering a Kickstarter for February, which I'm pretty excited about. It's called The Fog. Um, what else? Yeah, I really want to play Bear Raid. I've been begging people to play Bear Raid, but it has not happened yet. So I hope I will have some new games to talk about next time. And yeah, if you guys have any questions or comments, as always, please leave them in the comments section below. And I hope you all have a wonderful new year. Oh, and I will be making my top 10 of 2021 video um, soon. I hope to do that either tomorrow or Sunday and have it up in early January. It is really hard for me to decide what my top 10 list is. It's super agonizing. There's just so many great games I played. Um, but yeah, I'll go into that in a couple of days for you guys. So until then, I hope you guys have a wonderful time. So bye.